Okay, good evening. Welcome. I'm glad to see all of you here. Um, tonight's topic is very important. And I didn't actually realize how important it was until some time back when I started doing research. And I'll be very honest, I wasn't real excited about the topic that we're going to be talking about tonight, but I knew it was one of the natural doctors that God has given us to be well. And so I felt it was important uh, that we included it in what we uh, encourage people with. And so I began researching it. And as I began researching it, I became more and more excited. So I'm really hoping that by the end of tonight's presentation, that you will be excited as well with what we're going to talk about. So we've titled our presentation uh, tonight, Just Because You're Alive Doesn't Mean You're Breathing Properly. And that's the key, properly. You're going to see as we go through here. So we take breathing for granted because it's so automatic. It's something we do automatically. We don't think about it. Yet, do you really know how to breathe? The way you breathe controls your life, your health, your looks, your energy, your resistance to disease. In fact, your very lifespan. Did you know that before? The way you breathe, you're going to be so... Uh, impressed with what you learn here tonight because breathing is critical to all of these areas. You're going to see that as we go. This comes from the book Councils on Health. We are more dependent upon the air we breathe than upon the food we eat. I want to ask you a question. How many of you thought about what you were going to eat today? How many thought? Is there anybody that didn't think about what they were going to eat? I think one way or another, we would all think about what we were going to eat, okay? We would, either, we would either think about it in terms of, you know, what do you feel like for breakfast, you know? And we go by feelings. Well, that doesn't sound very good to me. I don't feel like that, right? And we go with what our taste buds are dictating. Or we might think about it in terms of our health, okay? I really uh, should have myself a good green smoothie, you know, I need that for my health, or I'm going to juice up some, some fresh vegetables and fruits for my health, okay? Most of us, I think every one of us, in one way or another, has thought about what we were going to eat. Now, how many of you thought about how you were eating? Did anybody think about how you were eating? Am I chewing well? Not drinking liquids with my meals? You know, making sure that food combinations are compatible, you know, not eating between meals, things like that. Probably most of you thought about maybe how you were eating. How many of you got up this morning and thought, what am I going to breathe today? <laughs> Probably none of you did. Um, unless you had a real, uh, maybe a problem with getting oxygen in, you're not really going to think about what you're breathing. Or maybe if you live in a very congested, smoggy, polluted area, you might think about what you're breathing. But other than that, we don't think about what we're breathing. And even far less, how many of you thought about how you're breathing? Did anyone stop and think, have you ever stopped to think about how you're breathing? Anyone here? Oh, we've had a couple hands. Well, that's good. How we breathe and what we breathe, you're going to see, are so important for good health. And I just want to state this again. We are more dependent, more dependent upon the air we breathe than upon the food we eat. And you're going to see as we go through this tonight. Your body begins to function with your first breath and continues until your last. How well it functions depends on how well you supply it with oxygen. Okay? A human being can exist without food for weeks, without water for days, but only without oxygen for minutes. You know people have gone for weeks without food. So we can go a long time without putting food in. We can go a long time, many, many days without putting any water in. But we can only go for minutes without putting any oxygen in. Our body is dependent upon that oxygen, a constant supply of oxygen. Every one of our more than 300 trillion cells requires a constant flow of oxygen, and this is carried to them by the blood. Your lungs, deprived of air, will be like a hungry person deprived of food. 
Indeed, we can live longer without food than we can without air, which is the food that God has provided for the lungs. Comes from the book Councils on Health, page 54. So air is the food for our lungs that God has provided. So let's take a look at these lungs. Lung tissue, I've got a picture here, this magnified lung tissue. Your lungs are composed of tiny little air sacs called alveoli. Tiny, tiny little air sacs that are like balloons that expand and contract, expand and contract. You have about 800 million of them. And if you were to flatten them and lay them out side by side, they would cover an area of about 100 square yards. Now, to put that in some kind of perspective, that's just slightly less than the equivalent of two football fields. I used to think it was one football field. I had heard that many, many years ago. Stretch out all your lung tissue and it'd be the equivalent of one football field, and I thought that was amazing. But when I looked up the size of a football field, I found that it's 100 yards by 53 uh, yards. So actually, for 100 square yards, which is what your, your lung tissue will stretch out and lay out flat to be, is almost the size of two football fields. That's hard to comprehend, isn't it? That your lungs contain that much tissue? And those little sacs are responsible for bringing oxygen in and expelling waste material. And we're going to see how that works. Here's a little video. When you breathe, air travels through your nose, down the trachea, and into smaller and smaller airways called bronchi. These bronchi branch into smaller passages called bronchioles and finally into small, thin, fragile sacs called alveoli. During inspiration, the alveoli in the lungs are filled with air. It is here that oxygen is exchanged for carbon dioxide. Blood cells absorb oxygen from the capillaries in the alveoli. As carbon dioxide, the waste product is released back into the lungs from the veins. During expiration, the carbon dioxide is expelled from the body. Oxygen-rich blood then travels to the heart so it can be pumped back to the body where it is needed. Okay, so that is the purpose of breathing, and that happens continuously. Your blood cells are, your red blood cells are going into the lungs where they're picking up oxygen and they're casting off carbon dioxide and other impurities from the body. That's constantly, every time you breathe out, that's being exhaled. Every time you breathe in, you are taking in oxygen, okay? Now, oxygen, the air that we breathe isn't 100% oxygen, and we'll, we'll kind of see some of the things that are in the, in the air that we're breathing in. But that's the purpose of breathing, and that has to happen continuously. In fact, for each and every one of us here, that has happened continuously from when we took our first breath. We've never stopped, and it ha happens automatically. It has to continue. Now, look at this. This is a quote that comes from the book, uh, counsels to the church, I believe, and we're told that the lungs are constantly throwing off impurities and they need to be constantly supplied with fresh air. Impure air does not afford the necessary supply of oxygen. Okay, what does impure air not supply? Oxygen. There's no oxygen in impure air. And the blood passes to the brain and other organs without being vitalized. Hence the necessity of thorough ventilation to live in close, ill-ventilated rooms where the air is dead and vitiated. That means the quality of it is spoiled, okay? Weakens the entire system. It, the system, becomes peculiarly sensitive to the influence of cold and a slight exposure induces disease. It is close confinement indoors that makes many women pale and feeble. They breathe the same air over and over until it becomes laden with poisonous matter thrown off through the lungs and pores, and impurities are thus conveyed back to the blood. Now, this was written a lot of years ago where pr predominantly it was women that were indoors. Today, is there anybody here who doesn't spend the majority of their day indoors? Anybody? Okay. Most of us, and there, there wasn't any hands, by the way, that went up, most of us are spending the majority of our day indoors. So this applies now to us. 
all of us. It's not just applicable to women. This applies to all of us now because we're, we're working indoors, spending a lot of time. So we're, br we're breathing out that carbon dioxide, we're breathing out poisonous matter, and if we're not opening up and allowing fresh air in, that means we are reabsorbing, breathing back in this air that does not have, as she talked about, it doesn't have the necessary supply of oxygen that our tissues are needing. And you're going to see how very important that is. Many are suffering from disease because they refuse to receive into their rooms at night the pure night air. The free, pure air of heaven is one of the richest blessings we can enjoy. In fact, breathing at, uh, or opening your windows at night to get some fresh air to breathe is probably one of the most important things that you can do. Because at night, you're not breathing real deep. Okay, so to begin with, you're not taking in a good amount of oxygen. And if your room is closed, or even if, if your uh, window is closed but your door is open, you're still circulating indoor air. And I'm going to be sharing with you here very shortly what's happening to our indoor air, okay? Open that window up, let the fresh air in, because as she stated, that many are suffering from disease because that air isn't coming in at night. Very important, open those windows up. Let's look at what the medical side has to say here. Townsend letter for doctors. Cells undergoing partial oxygen starvation send out tiny panic signals, which are collectively felt in the body as a continuous vague sensation of uneasiness, dread, or disaster. This low-level, generalized warning tends to get tuned out as mere background noise by the individual experiencing it, or it is attributed to other sources of uneasiness. People rarely suspect that the constant vague feelings of helplessness, fatigue, uneasiness are symptoms of cellular oxygen deprivation. Isn't that something? What I would really like to encourage any of you or any of those that will watch this on DVD or on the television, if you're ever having feelings of depression, hopelessness, helplessness, feeling out of control, okay, a lot of people, I'm surprised at the amount of people that come to us and say, I feel like my life is out of control. I'm panicky, uh, anxiety. Go to your window, go outside your, your, your apartment or your house, stand outside and breathe in deeply. In through the nose, hold that air and then let it out. Do that about five times and you will be amazed at the difference. Now, I'm not saying that this is the sole cause behind feelings of depression, anxiety and those types of things, but this definitely is a key factor in that lack of oxygen getting to the brain, okay? So when we're working indoors, obviously we want to have some fresh air coming in all the time so that we're getting that oxygen and we're, we're not going to have the level of anxiety and depression that we may otherwise be experiencing. Dr. Spencer Way from the Journal of the American Association of Physicians. Insufficient oxygen means insufficient biological energy and that can result in anything from mild fatigue to life-threatening disease. The link between insufficient oxygen and disease has now been firmly established. Isn't that something? Dr. Lataste in 1992 conducted a study with a team of scientists on health at high altitudes. They observed people who lived at high altitudes and found that there was a much higher incidence of drowsiness apathy, delayed reaction time, and reduced motor capacity as compared to those who lived in lower altitudes because of the reduced amount of oxygen that they were getting. Reduced oxygen is going to affect your mental performance, okay? And that's been clearly shown in many, many studies. Dr. Richard Lipman, renowned researcher, says, a lack of oxygen is the prime cause of 1.5 million heart attacks each year. Isn't that something? Lack of oxygen. Dr. Harry Goldblatt, Journal of Experimental Medicine. Lack of oxygen clearly plays a major role in causing cells to become cancerous. Did you ever think that oxygen was so important to your health and well-being? Okay, one more here. Dr. Arthur Guyton. 
He's the author of the textbook on medical physiology, says that all chronic pain, all chronic pain, suffering and diseases are caused by a lack of oxygen at cellular level. At the very smallest part, if you want to go right down to the cells of your tissues, that is where disease, pain, everything that you might be suffering is, is initiated. And he feels that it, lack of oxygen is the key factor in initiating that. Isn't that something? Oxygen is critical to your life and to your health. Now, let's, let's sum up uh, the benefits of breathing properly. So we found out it improves your general health as it nourishes your organs with oxygen and improving immunity. Improves digestion as oxygen is ne a necessary component in the production of gastric secretions. For those of you that may have seen the presentation that I did on how to avoid tunnel eating, and we talked about gastric secretions. We have a lot of gastric secretions, if you remember from that presentation, that our, be our bodies are producing. But oxygen is a necessary component of that. You have to have oxygen in order for your body to produce that. So that that means you will not digest your food well if you're not breathing well. Very interesting. It improves circulation. Without adequate oxygen, vitamin C cannot be assimilated properly, causing the breakdown of collagen and the hardening of the veins and arteries. You heard Rudy speak uh, in the presentation that he did on your external thermometer and how collagen is so important for good healthy skin. You need to have, he talked about taking uh, vitamin C as a supplement in order to help improve your collagen. But in order for that vitamin C to be properly assimilated, you have to have oxygen, good amounts of oxygen. So good breathe, uh, deep breathing. And we're gonna, we're gonna look at some exercises that you can do here very, very shortly here to help with that. Now, it improves blood function, prevents the clumping of red blood cells, and increases the function of white blood cells. We'll see that later. Releases accumulated tension. And one more, if my little clicker will work here. Subdues physical pain. I'm going to show you that one a little bit later on. You're going to see how oxygen subdues physical pain. Also, it strengthens and revitalizes the nervous system by decreasing stress and increasing feelings of well-being. Very, very important. Okay, this is a quote that comes from the book, The Ministry of Healing. In order to have good blood, we must breathe well. Full, deep inspirations of pure air, which fill the lungs with oxygen, purify the blood. They impart to it a bright color and send it a life-giving current to every part of the body. A good respiration soothes the nerves. It stimulates the appetite and renders digestion more perfect, and it induces sound, refreshing sleep. Isn't that something? So those good, deep inspirations of pure air. Now, I'm going to show you several breathing exercises, and you guys are actually going to get to do this. Um, but I just want to make a note here that if when you're doing these exercises, first of all, don't try to overfill your lungs, okay? So don't try to breathe in so deep that it feels like you can't get any more oxygen in. We're not trying to stretch your lungs. Okay, just like little, I said they were little balloons, just like little balloons, if you were to, to take a balloon and blow air into that balloon until it was overstretched, when you let that air out, it wouldn't go back to its original shape, would it? It'd be overstretched. We don't want to try to overstretch these little balloons in our lungs either. And if when you're doing these exercises, you find that you feel lightheaded or a little bit dizzy, that will, by the way, just be from additional oxygen coming into your system. But if you feel that, you just stop, just sit down, or you would just uh, return to a standing position, something like that, okay? But a lot of times when people have not been breathing well, and they start breathing in more, more air, more oxygen, they'll start feeling lightheaded and dizzy. Continue to do it, though. Uh, you can wait until that dizziness passes, which will just be momentarily. But continue doing those exercises, and you will find that uh, in a very short time, you're not going to feel that dizziness. Your body will be thankful for the extra oxygen that you're feeding it. 
So let's take a look at a couple. I'm going to run through what uh, these exercises are, and then we're going to try them. You guys can try them, OK? So this one here first is increasing lung capacity. So this is how we would increase our lung capacity. Very simple exercise to do. Stand with feet together. I'm going to recommend that when you start this, don't stand with your feet together. Just stand with them slightly apart. Because if you haven't been doing breathing exercises and you do start feeling a little bit lightheaded, you're more stable with your feet slightly apart. So maybe shoulder width, okay? And then you're going to inhale deeply while you raise your hands overhead. Now people always say, well, should I raise my hands this way or should I raise them? It doesn't matter. You just in while you bring your hands up over your head, okay? And it doesn't matter whichever way you'd like to do it. Then you're going to exhale as you bring your arms back down to a relaxed position at your side. And then what you're going to do is you're going to, with your feet still in that position, you're going to bend at the waist to the right. You're going to stretch your arm down to the floor as far as it goes. Okay, so this hand going down and your other arm is going to come up toward your armpit or you can raise it up over your head if you prefer. Okay, it doesn't matter. What you're doing is you're stretching out this side of your body, okay? So that's what you're going to start to do. So let's stand up. This is actually an ulterior motive to uh, make sure none of you are falling asleep. <laughs> okay, so first of all, what we're going to do is we're going to be breathing in deep while we bring our arms up over our head, okay? And then we're gonna let that air out, back down, okay? And now we're going to, to the right, Oh, you guys are going to the left, aren't you? <laughs> and you're going to hold that for about 10, 10 counts or 10 seconds, and then you're going to come back up. And you would do the same the opposite direction, okay? So you would do the same thing. You can bring your arm up over. Some of you are doing that. That's fine. Whatever feels good to you. Basically, what you're doing is stretching out that side of your body. And then as you alternate and do the other side, it would stretch out that side, okay? So that's a very simple one. You'll do that about five to ten times, okay? And that, if you do that every day, is going to start increasing that lung capacity. Before you sit down, let's try one more here. Uh, by the way, hold this position. This position you would hold for a count of ten, okay? So you hold your position and your breath for a count of ten, and then you return to your upright position while you exhale, okay? Alternate sides, repeat for five to 10 times. Now this one here is a very nice morning and evening routine. Um, this one, in the morning, you stand erect and you reach your hands up toward the sky as far as you can stretch. Imagine that something is pulling you up by the back, okay? So you're stretching that spine. Something is pulling up on your spine, okay? So you feel that pulling up and then up, up with the arms, okay? Stretch as far toward the sky as you can and down. And you're letting out your air. You're inhaling as you're reaching up. You're exhaling as you're reaching down. Morning and evening, doing those same routines. And what you're going to find is that this is going to help cleanse the impurities from your body and leave you with a sense of well-being. You can sit down now. Um, we had actually uh, one of our participants on a very recent cleanse retreat who, as, after she had heard this presentation, decided to try uh, experimenting with this morning and evening uh, routine of stretching and, and inhaling that, that uh, oxygen in. And she'd do it for about five times. And she came to me, she said, I can't believe how good that makes me feel. And you'll find if you start doing that, it will. It will make you feel really good as it uh, cleanses impurities from your body. Now, improving posture, improving posture. Again, I talked to you about improving posture when I talked to you about how to avoid tunnel eating. Um, but I want to talk to you about improving posture in connection with getting adequate oxygen to our bodies. So I want to show you a quote here. This comes from the book Total Breathing by Philip Smith. Poor posture inhibits the flow of oxygen throughout the body. Everybody should be sitting up straight now, okay? With less oxygen taken in, every cell in the body then becomes undernourished and hungry for fresh oxygen. Correct posture is a contributor to the overall health of the body. So if we have poor posture, we're constricting our lungs. 
okay, besides constricting our digestive organs, as I talked to you in that previous lecture. But now we're constricting our lungs, and we're not getting in good amounts of oxygen. So it's important that we sit straight, stand straight, allow those lungs the, the room they need to breathe. Now this is an exercise you'll be able to just sit in, in your seat here, and we're going to try this one too. But you can sit in a, a chair or in your seat there in a relaxed position. You don't have to have your eyes closed. It says to have your eyes closed, but it's fine to have your eyes open. And you're, what you're going to do is you're going to be exhaling slowly while you bring your chin down to your chest. Okay? And when, when your chin is down on your chest and you've completely exhaled all of your air, then what you're going to do is sit up, sit up and inhale quickly. You're going to do that very quickly. And you're going to find something very interesting in connection with your posture. So you can just sit there in a very relaxed, it's okay if you even sit slumped because you're going to find something very interesting with that. Okay, so let's just try it. We're going to exhale and we're going to let our chin come down to our chest, okay? All the air out. And once the air is out, we're going to breathe in quickly and sit up. What did you find you just did? Did you sit up straight? Okay, isn't it funny how it makes you sit up straight? Even if you start off in a slouched position, when you breathe in rapidly like that and lift your head up, it makes you sit up straight. It's a great exercise for improving your posture. So you can uh, hold your breath then for five to 10 seconds and then you release the air slowly while you bring your, your, uh, your chin down again. You do this five or 10 times or five to 10 times, and this is going to help improve your posture, okay? So just relaxing and then sucking that air in. Makes you sit up straight. Very interesting how that works. The lungs should be allowed the greatest freedom possible. Their capacity is developed by free action. It diminishes if they are cramped and compressed. Hence, the ill effects of the practice so common, especially in sedentary pursuits of stooping at one's work. In this position, it is impossible to breathe deeply. Superficial breathing soon becomes a habit and the lungs lose their power to expand. How many of you sit at a desk when you work? A lot of us do. And do you ever find yourself sort of slouching over, sort of hunched over? Um, as, as the stress or the busyness of the day picks up or the intensity of the work gets, gets uh, increased, you tend to hunch over as you work, okay? That's constricting the lungs. And that soon, as we're told in councils for the church here, uh, becomes a habit, and then the lungs actually lose their power to expand. Isn't that something? So we need to keep reminding ourselves as we're sitting at our desks and working to sit straight or to stand straight if we're standing, whatever it is that we're doing, making sure that those lungs have all of the room that they need uh, to, ex to expand. Now, these are ways to improve your lung capacity. This is, this is Rudy's uh, idea of how to improve your lung capacity. <laughs> but singing. Singing teaches excellent breath control, and it lengthens the duration of the breath, strengthens the diaphragm, and gently increases your lung capacity. Singing is a great way. Also, playing wind instruments controls and regulates breathing, scuba diving, that's one that Rudy enjoys doing, fast walking, fast walking, and that gets you breathing nice and deeply, swimming, swimming is excellent for improving lung capacity, jogging, aerobics are wonderful, rollerblading is excellent, that's one that Rudy and I enjoy doing, getting out and rollerblading, and you know, this next picture he had to put in here because rollerblading it, helping to improve your lung capacity. It's not limited to any age, okay? So you can't come and tell us, well, I'm too old, okay? No, no, no. I thought that was a great picture. Okay, so we need to think now about the air that we are breathing, the air that we're breathing. We know that it's important that we are breathing and how to breathe, but what about the air we're breathing? So let's take some time and look at the dangers in impure air. Canadians spend over 90% of their time indoors. And in fact, I would say that's probably true for, for most of the industrialized nations, that that is what we do now. 
uh, in our world is we're spending time indoors, most of our time indoors. And there's some groups such as infants and school children, elderly, disabled, homemakers, etc. they may sp spend an even greater percentage of their time indoors. So we need to understand what kind of air we would find indoors. Now inside, in, our, in any of these buildings, in any building, you're going to have what's called positively charged air. I'm not going to get into a technical uh, explanation of chemistry. That was never my most enjoyable subject. <laughs> uh, but I just want to show you very simply here this uh, diagram of an atom. Okay, so this is an atom. And in an atom, we have these key components. We have a nucleus which is composed of neutrons, which do not carry a charge at all, protons, which carry a positive charge, and then in the outer shell of that atom, we have what are called electrons, and electrons carry a negative charge. Now, in a balanced atom, we would have the same amount of electrons as we do protons, so there would be no charge to the atom. Do you follow so far? So the negatives and the positives would, would be equal, and there would not be a charge, okay? Now, in actual perspective, the nucleus of an atom is very, very small, and the electrical or electron uh, orbital is, is very spread out from the nucleus. It's sort of like our solar system, to maybe give it some perspective. So we have all of the planets that orbit the, the sun, okay? Um, but there's great spaces in between those planets and the sun. And that's what we have in atoms. It's a very similar sort of a structure. Now let's take a look here. Um, it's not uh, one dimensional as we just showed you. There's uh, electrons that are going in different orbitals around that nucleus. But you'll see, you can kind of see, these are just the paths of the electron around the nucleus. And you can sort of see uh, the large spaces in between those electrons and the nucleus. Now the protons and neutrons in the nucleus are held together very tightly. Normally the nucleus does not change, but some of the outer electrons are held very loosely. They can move from one atom to another. An atom that loses electrons has more positive charges because it has more protons okay, than it does electrons. So it's going to be what's called positively charged. An atom that gains electrons has more negative than positive particles, so it now has a negative charge, and a charged atom is called an ion. Okay, so let's carry on here. In nearly every indoor environment, over a period of time, the walls, ceiling, and floor surfaces acquire astronomical numbers of small positive electrical charges due to the friction of ambient air currents. And also, we're going to see it's also because of what we're exhaling. So what's happening inside of a room is that the walls, the ceiling, everything is building up a positive charge. Okay, so it's, it's getting it's losing electrons and it's getting positively charged. So in our room, in here right now, we will have what's called positively charged air. These surfaces are rarely made of electrically conductive materials, so there's no hard paths for the electron flow to neutralize these positive charges. Therefore, these constantly forming positive charges tend to continuously deplete the airspace of its normal complement of negative ions leaving an excess of airborne positive ions. So the Reader's Digest version is we're, we're making positive charged air in, our, in the room constantly, okay? So let's take a look at what that will mean to us. A negative charge is usually attached to oxygen. Okay, a negative charge. So if you have a negatively charged ion, or, it, well, it's going to be an ion, it's going to be usually attached to oxygen, and a positive charge is going to be attached to carbon dioxide. So as we breathe out carbon dioxide, okay, the room is becoming more positively charged. We're taking in oxygen, okay, we're taking those negative charges out, exhaling positive. Okay, do you understand? We're making positive, positively charged air in the room.
Now let's take a look, uh, Dr. Lipinski here, he's PhD, he measured uh, the air ion concentration in various types of buildings. He compared this to out, the out of doors. Here's what he found. Uh, for 510 negative ions outside, he found 110 positive, okay? So more negative than positive. By the way, this is good. You're going to see that we want to have those negative ions. We do not want to have those positive ions. Okay, so out of doors he found a good amount of negative ions. A wood frame structure, he found 320 negative ions, 520 positive ions. So now the ratio has switched. We've got more positive ions than negative. All right. Then an office building constructed prior to 1970, he found only 90 negative ions and 190 positive ions. In a modern airtight building, there were actually no negative ions and 150 positive ions. Okay, so what that's telling us, because we know those negative charges are attached to oxygen, that's telling us there's very little oxygen in those modern airtight buildings. And in fact, anytime we start moving indoors, we can see the reduction in oxygen taking place. And we have conversely or oppositely, we have the increase happening then of uh, carbon dioxide buildup. Positive ions or the lack of negative ions may cause serotonin hyperfunction syndrome or it's called, referred to as irritation syndrome. Symptoms can include sleeplessness, irritability, tension, migraine, nausea, heart palpitations, hot flashes with sweating or chills, tremor, and dizziness. The elderly become depressed, apathetic, and extremely fatigued. Isn't that something? It's because of not having enough negatively charged air or enough oxygen. We're not getting enough oxygen, and this is the result of not getting enough. This is the danger of positively charged air. Even the healing rate of wounds has been known to slow down, while the risk of infection accelerates. Isn't that something? Tension and depression are certainly more common. Conversely, negative ion air, when the weather is quite comfortable, not only stimulates morale, but actually relieves certain chronic diseases. Another danger here is radon gas. How many of you have heard of radon gas? Okay, a number of you have, that's good. So radon, let's take a look at radon gas. It, uh, radon gas from natural sources can accumulate in buildings, especially in confined areas such as attics and basements. It can also be found in some spring waters and hot springs. According to the United States Environmental Protection Agency, Epidemiological evidence shows a clear link between lung cancer and high concentrations of radon, with 21,000 radon-induced U.S. lung cancer deaths per year, second only to cigarette smoking. It's, it's a very uh, uh, dangerous gas to have in the home. Now, radon moves up through the ground into the air above. It can seep into houses through cracks in the foundation, drains, and sump pumps, openings around pipes and wiring, water from wells and from building materials such as concrete walls, cinder blocks, bricks and stones. Radon decay products, if inhaled, become deeply lodged or trapped in the lungs. As these decay products break down further, they release small bursts of energy that can radiate and penetrate the cells of mucous membranes, bronchi and other pulmonary tissues, thus initiating the carcinogenic process. Radon increases the incidence of all types of lung cancers. So you might be thinking, well, you know, is there really a concern? You know, how prevalent is this? Uh, how many homes could be affected? Well, I want to share with you that it's estimated that nearly one out of 15 homes in the United States has unacceptably high radon levels. And I did not check out the statistics for Canada, but I'm sure that it's very, very similar. One out of 15 homes already has unacceptably high radon levels. Now, testing for radon in any building can be done with a radon test kit, which is available from hardware stores and other retail outlets. Because radon levels tend to vary from day to day and season to season, 
Short-term tests do not give information about year-round advantage, or pardon me, average rate on levels. So it would be best to follow up a short-term test with another short-term test. Rate on levels tend to be greater in a basement. I, I uh, do not recommend, if you have your bedroom in the basement, I, we do not recommend that you sleep in a basement. Move your bedroom up out of the basement. For anyone that's staying in a basement, get out of the basement because you tend to collect more uh, toxic air in a basement. And of course, radon will accumulate there as well. Okay, other things that we need to be concerned about in our indoor air, formaldehyde. You've probably heard about formaldehyde, okay? I just wanna show you because formaldehyde by the way, there is no safe lower limit for formaldehyde. No safe lower limit. And you're going to see how many things it is in that we have all around us, okay? So formaldehyde, it's a colorless gas. It's irritating and has a sharp odor. It's widely produced around the world for use as a disinfectant and a preservative, and it's also used in textile finishing and in the production of resins. Let's take a look at some things. This comes from Health Canada. They say too much formaldehyde in some hair products. Health Canada says it has discovered almost a dozen more hair uh, smoothing products that contain formaldehyde above the accepted limits. Health Canada says formaldehyde is a known irritant and has been linked to cancer in people when inhaled chronically over a long period of time. The federal agency says it has received complaints of burning eyes, nose and throat, breathing difficulties and hair loss associated with the use of the products. Stylists who use these professional hair smoothing solutions are advised to stop immediately. Isn't that something? So, and again, I know this is coming from uh, Health Canada, but for those of you south of the border, it's going to be in your hair smoothing products as well. You know, so you might want to think about that when you use some of these products um, and ask your stylist, maybe go to natural products if these are things that you currently are using. Try to look at something more natural. Now, formaldehyde is a naturally occurring substance in the environment. It's made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. It also enters the environment through natural sources like forest fires and also certain human activities such as smoking tobacco, burning automotive and other fuels, and residential wood burning. When produced in the atmosphere by the action of sunlight and oxygen on atmospheric methane and other hydrocarbons, it becomes part of smog. So again, if you're in a city and you're breathing in smog, you're going to be breathing in uh, formaldehyde. You'll see here too how prevalent it is in so many uh, other things as well. Formaldehyde is highly toxic to all animals regardless of the method of intake. I want to show you a couple studies here very quickly. A 1988 Canadian study of houses with urea formaldehyde foam insulation found that formaldehyde levels as low as 0.046, 0.046, less than half of 1% parts per million, were positively correlated with eye and nasal irritation. A lot of times people come to us and they say, you know, my eyes are always burning, burning. You know, I always have this burning. And it could be the air that you are exposing yourself to in your home, in your workplace. You need to start thinking maybe some of those things if you're always having these kinds of irritations. Although many studies have failed to show a relationship between formaldehyde and asthma, a recent review of studies has shown a strong association between exposure to formaldehyde and the development of childhood asthma. Very interesting. Chronic exposure at higher levels starting at around 1.9 parts per million has been shown to result in significant damage to pulmonary function. So it's going to start causing significant damage to the way your lungs work. There's also research that supports the theory that formaldehyde exposure contributes to reproductive problems in women. A study on Finnish women working in laboratories at least three days a week found a significant correlation between spontaneous abortion and formaldehyde exposure. And a study of Chinese women found abnormal menstrual cycles in 70% of the women occupationally exposed to formaldehyde compared to only 17% in the control group. 
So we can see it's definitely causing some significant health issues. Because formaldehyde resins are used in many construction materials, it's one of the more common indoor air pollutants. The International Agency for Research on Cancer has reclassified formaldehyde as a known human carcinogen associated with nasal sinus cancer and nasopharyngeal cancer. So both of those cancers. Recent studies have also shown a positive correlation between exposure to formaldehyde and the development of leukemia, particularly myeloid leukemia. In the residential environment, formaldehyde exposure comes from a number of different routes. Formaldehyde can off-gas from wood products such as plywood or particle board, but it's produced by paints, varnishes, floor finishes, and cigarette smoking as well. Floor finishes can emit as much as 1.2 grams of formaldehyde per square meter per hour. So it's off-gassing all of this formaldehyde into the air. That level is nearly 1,000 times greater than is emitted from unsealed particle board. Pre-pasted wallpaper, while still wet, emits nearly 700 micrograms of formaldehyde per square meter every hour. Other sources of formaldehyde in indoor air include tobacco smoke, smoke that may leak from wood-burning appliances such as wood stoves and fireplaces. And I want to show you some more because it is so, it's, it's almost in everything. Many of the products found inside our homes contain and release very small amounts of formaldehyde into the air. Here are some examples. Furniture, cabinets and building materials made from particle board, medium density fiber board and certain molded plastics. Consumer products, including some latex paints, wallpapers, cardboard and paper products, dishwashing liquids, fabric softeners, shoe care agents, carpet cleaners, glue, adhesive, lacquers, some cosmetics. Wow. There's, there's, a, there's a real push for using natural cosmetics if you're going to use them, uh, such as nail polish, nail hardener, some permanent press fabrics. I want you to think about that, permanent press fabrics, okay? Uh, for example, cer certain curtain sheets, clothing, etc. Other fabrics labeled no iron, crease-free, or wash and wear have been treated with formaldehyde. Permanent press bedding items such as sheets and pillowcases are especially hazardous due to the lengthy nightly exposure over a period of time. So I would recommend uh, not using permanent press uh, sheets and bedding. Uh, go ahead and buy organic cotton. Yes, it's going to wrinkle up and it's not going to be all nice and smooth, but you know it's not going to off-gas toxins all night long while you're breathing. Okay, so it's in everything. Thousands of consumer items are manufactured with formaldehyde. Formaldehyde adds strength and absorbency to paper towels, disposable plates and cups, hard plastic dishes. It's used in the manufacture of consumer products ranging from milk cartons to paper currency, newsprint, perfume, shampoo. There's another push for using natural products. Lipsticks, toothpaste for sensitive teeth flavorings, air fresheners, nasal decongestions, mold retardants, etc. As a result of releases from these sources, formaldehyde is present at low levels in all Canadian buildings, and that applies to those of you south of the border as well. Okay, it's going to be in all buildings. Um, in 2002-2003, Health Canada measured levels of formaldehyde in the air inside a number of homes in Prince Edward Island and in Ottawa, and the levels ranged from roughly 2 to 81 parts per billion. Uh, but as I mentioned, there is no safe lower limit for formaldehyde. It is toxic in all ways that it comes into the body. Now, I don't want you to, to sit here now feeling so discouraged that we're all breathing in formaldehyde, okay? Because by the end of our presentation, I want to show you some ways that we can help to correct these uh, pollutions that we're putting into the air, okay? So don't sit here and get discouraged on me. <laughs> okay, some other indoor air pollutants that we need to consider Cigarette smoke, okay? Tobacco smoke is the most harmful and widespread known indoor air pollutant. Secondhand smoke is a combination of exhaled smoke and the smoke produced by the idling cigarette, cigar, or pipe. So it's the combination of those two. It consists of solid particles, liquids, and gases. It is a pollutant that you can easily control in your home by not allowing people to smoke indoors. 
Scientists have identified more than 4,000 different chemical compounds in secondhand smoke, including nicotine, carbon monoxide, ammonia, formaldehyde, arsenic, dioxins, and furans. Most of these toxic chemicals are created when tobacco burns. Others, such as lead and nicotine, are found naturally in tobacco and are released when it burns. Now, carbon monoxide. Here's another pollutant in our indoor air. Sources of carbon monoxide that can pollute our air, fuel-burning appliances such as furnaces, fireplaces, gas stoves, water heaters, especially those that are not properly vented or maintained, or when chimneys are blocked or dirty, okay? So that can all put carbon monoxide into the air. Idling vehicles in garages that are attached to homes or buildings. Barbecues, grills, space heaters, and other non-vented fuel-burning appliances that are designed for outdoor use. Tobacco smoke, of course, we just mentioned that one. Now, what are the health risks of carbon monoxide? Well, when you breathe it in, it builds up quickly and combines with the blood to produce something called carboxyhemoglobin, which reduces the ability of blood to carry oxygen. And probably most of us know that if we breathe in carbon monoxide, it's going to be very dangerous to our health. But we'll just take a look here. The effects of exposure to uh, carbon monoxide can be very serious. At low levels, symptoms can include headaches, tiredness, shortness of breath, and impaired motor functions. These symptoms sometimes feel like the flu. At high levels, or if people are exposed to low levels for a long period of time, people can experience dizziness, chest pain, tiredness, poor vision, and difficulty thinking. And of course, at very high levels, carbon monoxide can cause convulsions, coma, and even death. Okay, so that's a very serious uh, pollutant that we want to be aware of. Nitrogen dioxide, that's another gas that can be emitted indoors by combustion appliances like gas stoves. It can also enter the home from outdoor sources such as cars. Not a good idea to leave a car idling where the fumes would be coming into your home. Nitrogen dioxide irritates the lungs. It can decrease lung function and it increase susceptibility to allergens for people with asthma. Prolonged exposure to low levels of nitrogen, nitrogen dioxide has been found to increase the risk of respiratory symptoms such as coughing and wheezing. How do I prevent exposure to nitrogen dioxide? Well, an exhaust fan is going to be key because as we mentioned, uh, the, that it's coming from combustion type of appliances. So the main source of nitrogen dioxide in homes, it comes from gas stoves. If you have one, make sure it's equipped with a hood that is properly vented to the outside. Maintenance is critical. All combustion appliances, including furnaces, stoves, and water heaters, should be inspected by a qualified professional at least once a year. Make sure your appliances are working the way they're supposed to be working. Okay? This is especially important for gas burning appliances since leaks from gas appliances are more difficult to detect than those from oil burning appliances. Now, asbestos. Asbestos is something that um, we may not be real concerned about. Uh, it was used for many years in a variety of industries like construction and shipbuilding, mainly used for fire prevention, strengthening, and insulating purposes. Today, however, asbestos is used far less and generally just for strengthening products and structures. All forms of asbestos are considered to be carcinogenic, and there are links between it and diseases like asbestosis, lung cancer, and mesotheliomia. That's, that's actually cancer of your mesothelium, which is the, the lining of the different cavities in your body. Internally and externally, those cavities are lined, and that's a cancer of those linings. Okay? If asbestos fibers are enclosed or tightly bound in asbestos siding or floor tiles, and if the products are in good condition, the risk from exposure is low for, the, for building occupants. On the other hand, if asbestos-containing materials have not been properly installed or if asbestos-containing structures are not well-maintained, fibers can be released into the air and pose potential health risks. Today, there are comprehensive municipal, provincial, and federal regulations in place to reduce exposure to asbestos fibers, particularly in workplaces and public buildings and in consumer products. Unfortunately, other countries do not have those uh, 
regulations in place. This is a woman in India sifting asbestos without even a mask. Terrible. Very terrible. We also have in our indoor air what's called particulate matter. Particulate matter, you may have heard of that. That can be a mixture of substances from things such as carbon or soot emitted by combustion sources, tiny liquid or solid uh, particles and aerosols, so things that we spray that we talked about can be putting those particles into the air, fungal spores, pollen, things called endotoxins, that's actually components of the outer membrane of certain bacteria. This is what we call particulate matter that can be in our air. We can also get particulate matter from uh, other places as well. In properly maintained uh, homes, most of the airborne particulate matter comes from outside. It's not going to be coming from inside if your home is well maintained. However, some homes do have significant sources of indoor particulate matter that's generating inside, and that comes from things like cigarette smoking, okay, we've talked about that, cooking, especially frying and sauteing. Have you ever walked outside past maybe one of these fast food places or maybe you've driven past and you can actually smell the smell of whatever it is that they're frying in there? Okay, that's what's called particulate matter. That's little bits and droplets of that grease or whatever it is that's in the air. Okay, that's particulate matter. That's what we're talking about here. Malfunctioning combustion appliances, we just talked about that. Non-vented combustion appliances like gas stoves, wood-burning appliances like wood stoves and fireplaces, especially if the smoke is leaking or if there's backdrafts into the home. Okay, this is all putting what's called particulate matter into the home. And then, of course, if you have any issues with mold, mold growth in the home. Now, what are the dangers, potential risks of having per breathing in this particulate matter? Well, there hasn't been a lot of studies done. There's very few studies on the health effects of indoor particulate matter, but those available seem to link particulate matter to respiratory symptoms such as wheezing and coughing, especially in children. We have a lot of people that come to us with wheezing and coughing. They can't breathe well. And there's nothing that can really be pinpointed as an issue. And a lot of times it can be, this can be a reason or, or something to consider if you're having those symptoms. Some laboratory studies also indicate that particulate matter collected indoors can be toxic. There is one study that I wanted to share with you which I thought was quite interesting. Scientists working in the Netherlands exposed rats to high levels of particulate air pollution. Following the exposure, the researchers found that plasma levels of fibrinogen were elevated by 20%, which could presumably increase blood viscosity. That means it's going to make your blood thicker, okay? Leading to decreased tissue blood flow. They also measured a 350% increase in nitric oxide synthase in lung fluids. The researchers speculated that as particles lodge in lung tissue, they induce an increase in the production of nitric oxide. Under normal conditions, nitric oxide is an important neurotransmitter that aids numerous signaling pathways involved in motor learning, protein modification, arterial dilation, and immune defense. So under normal circumstances, it's good. We need it. But when conditions trigger the overproduction, of nitric oxide as seen in the Netherlands study, the result is serious damage to the endothelial cells lining the blood vessels of the lungs. So we need to be careful then to think about the particulate matter that we may, may be uh, breathing. And again, I'll, I'll talk about some positive ways that we can address these negative uh, uh, air pollutants that we have, um, some things that we can do. So don't get discouraged. I didn't include a lot of information about outdoor pollution because we all are probably familiar with outdoor pollution, but I did want to show you this one study that I thought was quite interesting. Christopher Summers, James Quinn, and colleagues published an earlier study which found that gulls living near a steel mill on Lake Ontario suffered from genetic mutations. In a current study, the researchers raised two groups of mice. The first, a half mile downwind of a steel mill on Lake Ontario, and the second, about 20 miles away. The mice breathing the polluted air had twice as many mutations in their DNA as the mice 
breathing fresh country air. Isn't that something? So we know we've probably all heard a lot about the dangers of outdoor polluted air. And so I, I didn't want to, you know, go into a lot of that. But uh, that was quite interesting. And that, I believe, is also a good reason why we maybe, if we're still living in the cities, need to think about getting out of the cities, getting out to the country where we have less polluted air. Now, we've got all this polluted air and we need to think about how we can improve air quality, okay? Ways that we can improve air quality. So we're going to take a look at some of the things we can do. Research into the use of biological processes to solve environmental problems both on Earth and in space has been carried out for many years by Dr. Bill Wolverton, formerly a senior research scientist at NASA's John C. Stennis Space Center in Bay St. Louis, uh, Mississippi. Based on preliminary evaluations of the use of common indoor plants for indoor air purification and revitalization, a study about a study using about a dozen popular varieties of house plants was done to determine their effectiveness in removing several key pollutants associated with indoor air pollution. And I'm going to be showing you some of those plants that they used in this study. Very interesting. You, you may have seen his book. He's got a book out, uh, How to Grow Fresh Air. And uh, very, very interesting. But NASA research on indoor plants found that living plants are so efficient at, at absorbing contaminants in the air that some will be launched into space as part of the biological life support system aboard future orbiting space stations. So they're actually going to send live plants out there to make sure that those astronauts have good quality air to breathe. And you're going to see how efficient some of these plants are at removing the pollution uh, that we have been talking about. So let's look at how God has given us the solution he's given us for the pollution that we're making. Okay, how to grow fresh air. Flowering plants such as the gabura daisy and chrysanthemums were rated superior in removing benzene from the chamber atmosphere. The chamber atmosphere was just they did an experiment where they had a chamber that they put different uh, gases and pollutants into, and they put these plants in there to measure how effectively they would remove these pollutants from the air. So these flowering plants were rated superior in removing benzene from the atmosphere. Isn't that interesting? Those daisies are beautiful, by the way. Other good performers are the Dracaena mesengia, the peace lily, and the golden pothos. So these are great uh, plants that you can also include uh, in your, in your uh, house to help remove these contaminants from the, from the air. Spider plants are especially good for detoxifying indoor air. Other helpful plants include the golden pothos that we just mentioned and nephthitis. I could have pronounced that one wrong. Um, Nephthitis, okay, wrap my tongue around that one. Okay, so plants are excellent for removing uh, indoor air pollution. Take a look at this. We talked about how dangerous formaldehyde is and that even at the lowest levels, there's no safe lower level for, for formaldehyde. Look at some of these plants here, like the Boston fern. Its removal rate is 1,863 micrograms per hour of formaldehyde that's being removed. It's taking a lot of formaldehyde out of the air. Uh, the dwarf date palm is another good one. Bamboo palm, excellent. The Janet Craig, another excellent one. Look at these, how much of formaldehyde that they are removing from the air. Excellent. So include these um, in, your, uh, in your repertoire of plants. Just remember the removal rate may vary with plant size and growth medium, okay? So... It's going to depend on how big your plants are. So airborne chemicals, as we already mentioned, aren't the only health hazards indoors. The fine particles, the particulate matter, has a significant impact on our health. And uh, there's certain plants that are very good at removing that particulate matter. And experiments by scientists of the Washington State University led them to conclude that foliage plants can reduce indoor dust levels and particulate matter by up to 20%.
So some good plants, as we've already mentioned, the Boston fern is excellent for taking formaldehyde out. That's the main pollutant that it removes. Other pollutants that it removes, xylene, uh, it, it's taking xylene out at a rate of 208 micrograms per hour. I think that's just great that God has provided something to take care of the pollution that we are creating. Um, recommended placement in your home. If you've recently bought new furniture or carpeting, place one or two Boston ferns in each of the appropriate rooms because you have to remember that that furniture, as we mentioned, is off-gassing formaldehyde and your carpet, okay, and other things as well. So put one or two of these in each of the rooms that you may have uh, put furniture or new carpeting into. English ivy, the main pollutant it's removing is benzene. This plant removed 90% of the benzene from a sealed chamber. It's excellent at taking the benzene out of the air. Other pollutants removed, formaldehyde and xylene. Recommended placement in the home. These are especially effective in a room that has been freshly painted or carpeted. They're also beneficial in a room that contains plastic equipment or furnishings, things like computers, printers, fax machines, or ink. Okay, so they're excellent for an office. This would be a great plant if you're indoors. The Arisha palm, the main pollutant removed is xylene, other pollutants formaldehyde, Recommended placement in the home, Arisha palms can be used effectively in virtually any room, but they're especially useful in those that are carpeted or contain freshly varnished furniture. So that's where they would be uh, most useful. Now the spider plant, that is an excellent plant. The main pollutant removed is carbon monoxide. The plant removed over 96% of this potentially deadly gas. Isn't that something? Other pollutants removed, xylene and formaldehyde. So it's taking other pollutants out as well. Recommended placement in the home. These are useful in kitchens with gas stoves or in rooms with fireplaces because of the potential for carbon monoxide buildup in those rooms uh, where, where it can accumulate. They're good in any room. They're excellent at cleaning the air. The Janet Craig, the main pollutant removed is formaldehyde also removing xylene, recommended placement in the home. These are especially effective in newly carpeted or newly furnished rooms. So those are some other ones that you can um, add to your collection of living plants. From councils on health, we're told there are life-giving properties in the balsam of the pine, in the fragrance of the cedar and the fir. And there are other trees that are health-promoting let no such trees be ruthlessly cut down. Cherish them where they are abundant and plant more where there are but few. The plants are what God has given us to clean up our air. So it's very important. We need to cherish those plants. And I know even myself over the years, I've gotten more and more busy. And so I've tend to, tended to, when you know one of my living plants died off, I was replacing it with a plastic one. You know, a very nice looking, not plastic, but silk, you know, very nice looking one, looked very real, but it's not doing anything. It's probably off gassing, you know, probably has formaldehyde in it or something. Um, you need to have living plants. So after I did research uh, for this presentation, I decided, you know, plastic plants are going to be going and being replaced with living plants. And, you know, if they die, that's okay. I can go buy another one and put it there, you know. But we need to have those to clean up our air, clean up the pollution inside. Now, I want to talk to you uh, very quickly here about negatively charged air. You remember what positively charged air is, okay? That's where that atom has lost an electron and it now has a positive charge because it has more protons, okay? And we saw the dangers of positively charged air. But I want to show you now negatively charged air and how beneficial it is. Negative ions enhance mental performance and concentration. In 1969, Dr. Solman, head of the Department of Applied Pharmacology at Hebrew University in Jerusalem, brought in groups of people to spend some time in a room low in negative ions, so it didn't have much oxygen in there. 
and also in a room that contained an overdose of negative ions, lots of oxygen. While in each room, subjects were given word, figure, and symbol tests. They scored significantly higher on these tests when they were in the negative ion enriched room. Plus, while in the negative ion room, they showed that they had a slower, stronger pulse rate of alpha waves from the brain. Alpha wave rhythms are a measure of the brain's activity and health. A slow, strong alpha wave pulse rate indicates healthiness, calmness, and heightened alertness. When the subjects were in the negative ion deficient room, they showed signs of irritability and fatigue in addition to lower test performance. Interesting. So it's going to help with improving your mental performance. Also helps to prevent migraine headaches. Migraine headaches originate when an overload of serotonin causes the diameter of blood vessels leading to the brain to dilate and get wider in the brain. Consequently, blood flow increases and pain receptors in the vessels are stretched, which leads to the excruciating pain associated with a migraine headache. In numerous tests and studies, though, negative ion treatment has proven to prevent the overproduction of serotonin and therefore the subsequent migraine headaches. So as we get the oxygen in and we have purer blood, we're not going to have the problem with those migraine headaches. Negative ions are a natural antidepressant. In a study conducted by Columbia University, 25 people with SAD, that's seasonal affective depression, sat in front of a negative ion air purifier for a half hour every morning for a month. Half of the subjects were given a low level of negative ions and the other half a high level. The higher level of negative ion treatment proved to be as effective against SAD as antidepressants such as Prozac and Zoloft and without the side effects of these drugs. So for anyone who may currently be taking some of these antidepressants, you can actually give, get the same uh, benefit for your, uh, without those negative side effects from the drugs simply by increasing the negative ions in the air. Okay, and I'm going to tell you some ways that you can do that here shortly. Now, negative ions for a positive attitude. Positive ions, which are found in abundance in most indoor environments, as we talked about already, cause an overproduction of serotonin. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter, as we mentioned, that helps the body deal with mental, emotional, and physiological stress. And overproduction initially causes hyperactivity, which rapidly leads to anxiety and in some cases depression. Negative ion treatment has proven to be successful in reducing the overproduction of serotonin and therefore successful in alleviating depression in some cases. Very interesting. So if you suffer from depression or know someone who's suffering de from depression, you may want to encourage them to uh, look at getting more negative ions into the air. Negative ions help combat fatigue. In 1957, a study published in the Journal of General Physiolo Physiology concluded that negative ions reduce the overproduction of serotonin, a neurohormone that leads to exhaustion, among other things, when over produced. So it's going to help combat fatigue. The more difficult, the better. In a study conducted by Surrey University at the uh, Norwich Union Insurance Group headquarters, the employees in the computer and, and uh, data preparation section were exposed to high levels of negative ions. They showed a 28% increase in overall task performance. The more difficult the task, the more dramatic the improvement tended to be. Isn't that something? Isn't that interesting? Negative ions are so important. Driving, I thought this is very, very interesting. Driving, in 1972 in Geneva, statistics showed that whenever there was a drastic change in weather and a consequent drop in the negative ion concentration in the air, traffic accidents rose by more than 50%. Just before a storm comes in, there's a lot of positive ions in the air, okay? So there's a, 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 a big drop in negative ions, and they show traffic accidents increasing by more than 50%. So if you're going to drive, drive after a storm, it's safer, <laughs> okay? But I thought that was so interesting that it was affecting people in that way. Negative ions help us to sleep better. 
In 1969, French researchers found that the overproduction of the neurohormone serotonin caused sleeplessness and nightmares. In using a negative ion electronic uh, air cleaner to treat a group of people experiencing sleep problems, as a result of serotonin overproduction, he found that most of them were able to sleep better. So negative ions are so important to our health. But how do we get them? One other, way I, one other uh, thing that I want to show you here, which happened, this was incredible that they found with negative ions. And I've put the abstract up here, so those that get the DVD, I know it's small, but uh, if you have the DVD, you'll be able to read the complete abstract there. But I just want to show you a portion of the abstract and what happened here. Rudy spoke to you when he, he talked to you about our external thermometer. He spoke to you about natural killer cells, okay? You may remember that and how they attack cancer, okay? Look at this. In this particular study, we expanded the previous study, they had done a previous study, and placed 15 subjects in negatively charged air conditions for two weeks during the night and analyzed various biological parameters. Although individual biological reactions differed from subject to subject, natural killer cell activity increased significantly following living in negatively charged air condition. Uh, these people were only in there for two weeks, and they saw a significant increase in natural killer cell activity. Now, natural killer cells are an incredible part of your immune system because normally your immune system has to be activated. Natural killer cells do not have to be activated. They can sense if there is a cell in your body that is stressed. Very interesting. And they can go there and deal with it. They take care of viral infections. They take care of tumor formation. Okay? You want to have lots of good natural killer cells in your body. So by having an increase in negative ions, just in two weeks, they saw a significant increase in natural killer cells. I thought that was incredible. I really enjoyed that uh, particular study that was done there. Now, I talked to you about pain and how uh, positively uh, charged air increases our, our pain sensation. Look at what happens with negative ions, what they're finding here. At the University of Pennsylvania's Graduate Hospital and at Northeastern and Frankfurt Hospitals in Philadelphia, Dr. Kornbluh found evidence that negative ions tranquilized persons in severe pain. Today, all burn cases at Northeastern are immediately put in a windowless ion-conditioned room. In 10 minutes, usually the pain has gone. That's amazing for a burn patient to have all the pain gone that quickly, just from being in that increased oxygen in, uh, room. Patients are left in the room for 30 minutes. The treatment is repeated three times every 24 hours. In 85% of the cases, no pain-deadening narcotics are needed says Northeastern's Dr. Robert McGowan, negative ions make burns dry out faster, heal faster, and with less scarring. They also reduce the need for skin grafting. They make the patient more optimistic, and he sleeps better. Isn't that something? Encouraged by this success in burn therapy, Dr. Kornbluh, Dr. Meinhardt, and their uh, Northeastern's, uh, chief, he's Northeastern's chief uh, surgeon, and his associate, Dr. T.A. David, boldly tried negative ions in relief of deep post-operative pain. During an eight-month test period, they exposed 138 patients to negative ions on the first and second days after surgery. That's usually when you have the most intense pain, okay? In 79 cases, 57% of the total negative ions eliminated or drastically reduced pain. At first, Dr. Mein, says Dr. Meinhardt, I thought it was voodoo. Now I'm convinced that it's real and revolutionary. Isn't that something? So increasing negative ions, which means we're increasing the oxygen in our uh, environments, is going to help reduce pain. Very, very interesting. Now, how are negative ions produced? If they're so wonderful for us, we would like to know how they're produced. 
They can be produced in several ways. The ions we're concerned with, oxygen ions, are most commonly produced through disturbance of water molecules, such as in fast-flowing rivers, or indoor waterfalls, or the ocean, the waves coming in. Okay, that's producing uh, negative ions in the air. The disturbance of water molecules occasionally displaces an electron, causing it to break off from its host. You remember that that electron